It's time for The Story Behind the Person, featuring lively, in-depth conversation with compelling guests from our community. And here is our host, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Hello and welcome to this episode. My guest today is Suzanne Garriock, a musician, a teacher, and a fantastic violin player. We'll see if we can even get her to play a tune or two for us. We'll be right back after these messages. Top care with top stylists. Book your next hair appointment with Port Perry's award-winning hair salon, Rosario Greco Styles. The hair experience you deserve. Book today. Call 905-985-0099. At Voss, your independent grocer, it's all about hometown living and shopping. Owned and operated by Terry and Christine Voss, their newly renovated Port Perry store carries many local items to support our town and its residents. Welcome back. As I mentioned, my guest today is Suzanne Garriock, a musician, an educator, and a fantastic violinist. Suzanne, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, I don't know that much about violins, so I'm eager to find out a whole lot about it. Before we get into that, I want to find out a little bit about you. So, you live in Durham Region. I sure do. I live right here in Port Perry. Wow. And, but you weren't born here. You have a slight, slight French accent. Oh, you noticed. Which tells me you must be from Quebec. I am from Quebec, born and raised. Whereabouts? Um, I grew up mostly in Montreal, in the East End, in Ville d'Anjou. And uh, when I was in my early teens, my parents uh, moved to the country. Okay. So you started playing the violin when you were young, I assume. Yes. How old were you when you started playing? Well, when we were visiting cousins. I have 27 first cousins. 27. So. Of course, well, you're French. Yes. We're French Canadian, right? <laughs> um, my cousins were all learning the violin and the cello. And when I was eight, I got to try my cousins, who's the same age as me, because I've okay. got several stages, same age as me. And uh, I was hooked. I really? was completely hooked. And I had to work hard on my parents. I come from a very modest family, so I had to right. work hard for my parents to, uh, to buy me a violin and start learning. Was it a, are, your, are your parents musical? My dad was a tenor. Okay. Um, didn't do that professionally, but he was trained professionally. Right. And, and uh, your mother? my mom is completely tone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been fun growing up. Like, please don't sing mom. <laughs> well, please don't sing mom. But she was very um, uh, knowledgeable about music mm-hmm. and um, always encouraged us to, uh, to grow with our right. uh, musical music education. Yeah, I, I have an issue with singing, too. I think I sound great, especially in the shower. But other than that, nobody else seems to think so. And it's OK until I go to church. And it, where you feel obligated to sing, right? Yes. So I'm sure that was the case. But with church your... is a safe place to sing. Yeah. <laughs> no, not when <laughs> yes. I sing. So now you said a lot of your cousins were playing uh, stringed instruments, cellos, violins, violas. H- how did that happen? It just just happened or? Well, like my, on my dad's side, um, all my cousins were involved in the Suzuki program. Okay. Uh, the Quebec version of the Suzuki program. And my aunt was, because the Suzuki encourages the parents to learn with the children, so they would Uh-oh. practice more at home. Um, my aunt was involved as well. So that really, that's a model that I've always uh, encouraged. Okay. And um, not in the school setting, obviously, because that's right. just about impossible. But um, I just loved it. And, and I just fell in love with the instrument back, right. way back when. It's, it's a beautiful instrument. Um, the technique of playing a violin, I think, is extremely difficult. Um, if, if someone plays by ear, then on a piano, for example, you can hit the keys and you kind of get The note is this, right there. Yeah. And on a violin, if you can play by ear, you may know where the note is, but first of all, there aren't any frets, right? There is not. So you're no. kind of all over the map with, with the well, fingers. Well, you're not all over the map. There is a technique and you just have to learn it. Right. And but it's much more difficult to learn a violin technique than, than say, another instrument. I don't want to downplay instruments because I know they're all very difficult to learn, but some are easier than others, correct? Well, I kind of Googled this because I kind of knew you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of Googled wh- what instrument was the most uh, difficult to learn, and the violin came up as number one. Right. I could see that. However, um, throughout my career, I tried to make it as accessible as possible and teach as many right. kids as possible because I just love it. And you started playing when you were eight, so you've been playing for 17 years now, I wonder. Just about that, That's good. yes. That's good. Thank you. See what I did there? That, yes, yeah, okay. I did. <laughs> so, so why did you folks end up moving to Ontario? Well, I was um, in dire need of learning English. 
Okay. And uh, so you grew up in a French only household. Absolutely. Okay. Although some of those cousins um, are, um, gr- my uncles were French, but they all married I- Irish ladies. Oh, okay. So my wow. cousins are first language English, second language French, and uh, so. But when when in my studies, I studied in physiology. Okay. And uh, I was in dire need of lear- learning English. Right. I mean, Which I thought it, I knew until I moved here. Well, it's like me speaking French, right? I thought I know how to speak French until you said something to me in French, and that was the end of that. So how old were you when you came to Ontario? I, I came in 1989 okay. um, for one year. Okay. Oh, just for one year? Uh, yeah, yeah. You didn't like it? Uh, no, I loved it. Oh. And then I stayed for one more year because I loved it. Okay. And my English still needed work. Right. And then the third year I was here, uh, I was teaching grade 8 in phys ed. Okay. And uh, participating in um, Ontario Philharmonic right. Orchestra okay. and the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra and doing weddings for people that really? found out that I played the violin. And I met some wonderful people here and then they offered me grade one. Oh. And that never saw me, I always thought, saw me as a professor or end of high school's yeah. teacher. And they offered me grade one and I had been observing um, the primary teachers for two years and I thought, oh, I want to try this. Right. So I so, stayed. So were you teaching in Quebec or were N- you? Well, no, well. Mm. Were you thinking I of did, teaching? Well, I, I tried for a few months okay. um, and did not okay. enjoy my experience. I went right back to university after a okay. few weeks and registered to do my master's. So, so when you were going through university and that, you were not, you were playing the violin, but you were not looking to make a career out of playing the violin at that point, right? No, it I, might, nev- maybe I never really have, actually. Really? No. It's a little late now to not do that because you have made a career playing the violin, right? Well, I, n- not professionally. No, no. Right? Well, you, you taught violin, right? They paid you to do that, so. You well, know. actually, most of my teaching violin was done extracurricular in the school. Okay. Yeah, yeah I wondered about that because I know, and I'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes about um, playing through recess and lunches and stuff like that. Um, so when you were going through high school, you would have been playing violin already, right? And, and probably pretty accomplished if you started at eight years old. Yes. And so did you ever have any jobs playing the violin during school or did you find a corner somewhere at St. Catharines and Maisonneuve or something <laughs> and uh, play violin? In Montreal, um, I was part, I, first year I went to a school that had a program, like a music concentration program. Mm-hmm. So yes, I played a lot at school with, they had a string program. Okay. And then I moved to a public high school and um, it was more where they could use me as a string player, okay. but because I was a good musician, um, they put me on anything they needed. So okay. I've played French horn, oboe, clarinet. Really? Um, wow. Tuba once. Um, I've, like, because I could read music, a yeah. lot of the students, like I would have been the equivalent here of grade eight and grade nine. Okay. And because I was already um, an accomplished musician, right. they would, oh, we need a hobo for this piece. Can you? So sometime in the band, I would be moving from one instrument wow. to the other depending on the piece they were playing. And I guess, and I'm ignorant of this, but I guess once you you know how to read music, it's a matter of knowing where the notes are on the instrument and that's it. A little bit. The rest is easy. I started music with the Baroque recorder and the Orff music. That's where my um, early childhood, until I picked up the violin kind of full time, uh, stayed. So I had that fingering thing okay. figured out. <laughs> so when you, when you were learning to play, like how, how much dedication did you give to it? Because at eight years old, I mean, it's, you know. Oh, did, I, did was, you, I was like annoying every everybody in my house with it. <laughs> Pretty That's good. Funny. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to play a piece for us. Are you okay to do that? Absolutely. Okay. We'd love to. Um, I see your violins. So you're all ready to go. Has it been tuned and everything? It's been tuned Perfect. and everything. And the piece you're going to play is called? I chose a piece today called Por Una Cabeza. That doesn't sound French at all. It sounds no, more it's Spanish. No, it's very Spanish. Okay. It's by Carlos Gardel. And the version I'm playing today is arranged by David Scott. Okay. It was also written by Alfredo Lepera. I think that was the, um, the lyrics because it's a song. It's part of the classical reper- repertoire. And uh, unfortunately, this duo uh, died in a plane crash in oh, South dear. America. Um, I believe in the 50s. Right. And um, what's happening is um, it's a story of a 
of a man who lost his fortune in, in okay. a horse race, but and he made an analogy of his great loss, having lost his great love. Awesome. I look forward to hearing it. So, yeah. So it's an, an orchestra excerpt okay. that I mix a little bit to uh, Perfect. make a piece. We have a stage at the other end of the studio, so okay. make your way over there. Absolutely. And, um, and we'll listen to Delighted it. It'll be awesome. To play for you. All right. Thank you. Amazing, Suzanne. That was just wonderful. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and learn more from Suzanne Garriock, a wonderful musician, and who knows, maybe we'll even ask her to play again. We'll be back right after these messages. PP Print is excited to offer Port Perry wearables, featuring two great designs. Show your Scugog pride with apparel and headwear. We have you covered. PP Print, more than just print. Welcome back. My guest today is Suzanne Garriock, a musician, an educator, and a really fantastic violin player. Suzanne, welcome back. That, that was amazing. That was just really, really, it makes me want to pick up a violin and actually, no, it doesn't. It's very, very complex. Well, it made you want to pick up the yeah, violin. Let's not go there. It, uh, <laughs> no, you play beautifully. And that was a very nice piece too, that, that well, thank you. Spanish. Thank you. I was looking at- We have uh, a new conductor at the Durham Chamber Orchestra. Okay. And uh, he picked that piece for, the, for our last concert. Really? I, I'm hooked on that piece now. I've been exploring it for it's a nice. few weeks. It's nice. And you play it beautifully. You really do. Thank you. Yeah. So you obviously love music. What's your favorite type of music? While I'm in the car, it's still classic music. Is I it? find it relaxing without putting me to sleep. Right. right? It's, it's relaxing in a good way. Okay. But I like all kinds of music. Yeah. I really do explore. When I travel, I like to explore the music of where I travel. Right. Um, Have you been to the Netherlands? 
Not yet. No, because the Dutch music is, is to die it's for. It's the best, right? Oh, everybody loves Dutch music. <laughs> you get the wooden shoes going and it's, it's never I mind. think the music tells a lot about the culture of the place you travel. It does, very much so. That's very true. That's very true. So you, you taught for the majority of your career. What, what got you into education, into teaching? Like, why did you want to teach? Or did you always want to teach from... From, from as far as I remember, I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. I decided to learn English in a school. Right. Thinking it was the best, where do you learn the best <laughs> English? I figured sense. in a school, but I, and I had my teaching permit that I had done okay. uh, throughout my studies regardless. Uh, the, te the, the process in Quebec back then was a little bit different. Right. And it was just a few extra course you had to take and do a practicum and then you had your permit. Um, so I came here um, mm -hmm. thinking I would just learn English and go back to complete my PhD. Right. But once I was in the school and teaching, I realized that. That's a love. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, it was and, pretty hard to deny after that. But, but you, weren't, you weren't teaching just music, right? You were teaching whatever the curriculum was. No, and I was then, a French immersion teacher. Okay. Uh, oh, for okay. 33 years. Wow. Okay, that's, that's amazing. Um, and then you got into, you were playing music, you, you introduced violins because, was it a little girl who brought her violin to school at show and tell or something like that? Yeah, that you it's actually, she's quite famous today. It's Lauren Malion. Um, okay. She's part of a group called Lion. Right, right, right. Uh, or a child, child, I think. And she goes by Lion. Right. And um, L-Y-O-N, right? L-Y-O-N, yes. that's right. And she brought her violin to school one day for show and tell. And she, I told her, well, I play the violin too. And, and she gave it to me and she could then play. Yeah. So I had this tiny little quarter size she? violin. She would have been grade one, so okay. six or okay. seven. All right. And so I played with the little violin and, and uh, I told her, I said, well, you know, it's hard sometimes to practice. So you're tired after school. So yeah. why don't you bring it then at recess? I'll bring my violin. We can practice together. And then kids would walk by, by at the beginning of recess. Oh, I played a violin too. Can I play, bring mine? Really? And that's how the Arch Cornish Violin Club was born. Wow. And, and, and then you went from about um, uh, a couple of dozen kids 25 some odd years ago to over 60, right? Yeah. When the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, we had 66 mm. kids in the program. Amazing. One but of it my was all extracurricular though. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So one, one of my favorite concerts is the Durham youth orchestra when they start and i think his name is uh, john beaton yes the conductor. when is. they start they're little four-year-old five-year-olds whatever and they play mozart's twinkle twinkle that's little right. star yeah that's and it's right. it's just amazing to hear them with the cute little violins it's, it's unbelievable so okay so you were teaching throughout and um you 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 ended up with a lot of violins some you bought yourself at auctions some were donated um, so what did you do with these violins? Well, um, if you remember December 2019, um, we had our Christmas concert and then the teachers were in, um, we were what we went into work to rule. Okay. So then we couldn't have, um, extracurricular anymore. Right. So I called for all the violins to be sent home, like the violins that were privately owned sent home. I sent emails and upon emails. And then the violins that were left at school were I'd, either I got emails that they were donating them to okay. the school or so on and so forth. And then the pandemic hit. Right. And then we couldn't do, you would think violin with a mask, it would have been okay, but we couldn't cross cohort. Right. Um, the government wouldn't allow kids from different classes to get together in the gym, even if it was with social distancing. Right, right. And yeah. allow us to... Um, to practice together and then we couldn't do it like every recess like I was doing before every recess is then to lunch hour right because that's what you need to have the time to practice so anyway when I decided to retire last year I was left with 22 violins wow. in working condition so I'm good what I'm going to do is because you played a beautiful classical piece I'm gonna put you on a spot and see if you can do a little bit of a jig would you be okay doing that challenge on all right why don't you do that join us over in the uh, in the other half of the okay. studio and uh, we'll listen to the, uh, the jig.
just amazing. I love, I love those shanties, those type. It always reminds me of being down east. Suzanne, you're an amazing musician. You really are. Thank you. It, um, so I'm intrigued. So you, you were just talking before you, you um, entertained us with that piece. And that, I should mention, that was called The Devil's Dream? Yes. Okay. I may learn to play that one day. The first one I learned. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Okay, I may not go learn to play it then. <laughs> Anyways, so you ended up with 20 some odd violins after, at the pandemic that you were stuck with, and then you retired from teaching. And, and I tried to return some of those violins to the students, right. but most of them were... Onto other things. Yeah, or too small for them. Right. So, and they had donated them. A lot of them I had purchased anyway. Okay. We have a picture, actually, I'm going to ask me if we can throw it up on the screen, of a magazine cover that has you with all these violins around it and that. We'll throw that up on the screen. There it is right there. Look at you. You're so prepared. And um, so, so the violins, um, so what, what happened to them? What did you do with them? I, I'm assuming there was no one to take over the music program well, with Well, throughout violins. the years of the Violin Club, um, the Durham District School Board, when they found out that, that I, had had, um, I had a violin club at Orange Cornish, um, and in 90, some, uh, at the end of the 90s, they, they built the big um, Durham District DDSB um, head office. Okay. Before that, they were renting spaces everywhere right. in Oshawa Whitby. And so they moved stuff and they found a bunch of violins and violas. Okay. Well, because back then they had a string program and mostly in high school. Right. I looked at these violas that are like another, right. this much bigger than right. my violin. And I look at my students and I thought, there is no way I'll be able to have student play this too big. Right. So I kind of did a little research with the help of the VP at the time. And... Um, I think it was in 2003. Okay. Um, we had Andrea Hansen, who is the founder of Strings Across the Sky, okay. who came mm -hmm. to us. And the, the violas were not in playing condition. And of course, the violin club never had any budget. Like of it course. was all, Typical. you know, self funded by me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she took the violas. And gave us a master class in exchange to the violin oh. students. So it was really cool because at oh. the time, Andrea was playing with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Okay. She was uh, one of the principal violists violist there. Mm. And um, so with um, Strings Across the Skies, they repaired the instruments for free in the various... Um, okay. I think they have a deal with one, but I don't want to name it because I'm not sure which one exactly. Okay. But the shops in Toronto that repairs the instruments for them. Right. And what they do is that um, they go teach in um, First Nation, so, Indigenous nations up in Northern oh, Ontario. So are, is this a group of individuals who took this on and just started this program? Andrea Hansen is actually the founder. Okay. She has unfortunately passed away since. Because there's a De Deborah Jones. That's right. Involved? That's her yeah. niece. Oh, that oh, is, is now okay. running the program. And is it a not-for-profit? Is that how it, how it works? It's a non-profit organization. Okay. And uh, what they do is they, um, they go into Indigenous communities mm -hmm. because since first contact, in our Indigenous communities were fiddling. Right. They oh. learned fiddling from, because there's okay. always a violinist on the boats. Right. Since the program. So they must have been extremely happy to get those 20 some odd violins from you. They were pretty happy yeah. to get the violins. And because they were little ones, then they can include young children in there yeah. too. Wow. So, and do you play with them? Like uh, I am going to play in Perry Sound. Wow. Um, oh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> in the summers, um, I go for a, a week to okay. do a camp. That's great. It's uh, amazing. Yeah. You also, you're into drumming too, right? I am. I only have a few seconds left, but uh, I know. Uh, the drumming is because not everyone can play a violin. So you're offering an alternative to, to people who are challenged. Is that a, a right yeah, word? Yeah, well, the violin, you know, you have to have, um, you have to have students who, are, who have a, a little bit of fine motor control right. and the ability to uh, learn to read music. Uh, right up to a certain level right yeah. um in our school um back in the early 2000s we did have an associated class that had students who were perhaps not cognitively able to learn to read period okay. or read music definitely not read music or had physical challenges right. that did not allow them to have the fine motor control to learn right. the recorder or anything that required fine motor control so the drumming then so then yeah. I, we brought in the drumming into the school, and, and I, I can't 
say I because it was a team. Right. You know, we, I've always worked in teams. Yep, there's no I in team. There's no I in team. Uh, the violin, there was definitely me. I was always the only violinist. But right. the uh, the drumming, it was a team. And it's, uh, it became me eventually because the team, they all retired. But um, the, uh, the so anyway, eventually... The Bagwatan community yes. also helped us purchase drums. Okay. And we collected drums. And um, yeah, so we could include Wonderful. this very inclusive program. Sounds great. Sounds, sounds like you've really dedicated your, your life to not only to music, but to also helping others. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. Aww. It goes very quickly. I know we could chat it forever. Does. And I could even learn to play the violin or not. So you have. Um, thank you very much. Before I let you go, though, before we end, um, I'm going to see if I can get you to play one more because I really like that, that chanty that you played. So maybe you could do another one of those if that would be okay. I can sure do that. And I will honor some of my Irish ancestors and play the go. Irish washerwoman for you. Th thank you very, very much. And while Suzanne is setting up, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Hope you join us each month for the story behind a person right here on Rogers TV. Suzanne, the show is yours. <laughs>